Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the uh, latest um, Spaces uh, webinar. Um, today we are looking at uh, schools and ventilation. Um, there will be initial, uh, we'll have an initial introduction from uh, Henry Burridge, who's a senior lect lecturer in the fluids mechanics section at Imperial College London, uh, about a, a number of projects uh, that uh, he's been working on, looking at um, um, air quality and temperature, which is, uh, I'm sure, on everybody's mind at the moment. And then we're going through um, Herschel Patel from the uh, head of energy at the DFE will be coming in to do a little bit of uh, background of the, the thought process with how the DFE evolved with these type of projects. So that's initial introduction on that side. Um, I suppose by other means of introduction, uh, I'm Steve Rufus um, from Dorset Council, Vice President of Spaces and uh, Head of Profession for Engineering. Um, this is one of um, this was was going to be one of the presentations we had at our study day, net zero carbon and building resilience. But uh, due to the issues with the train strikes and uh, other things happening, we've we've looking to roll these other webinars out as we go forward. Um, with this one, just as a thought, as we go through, if you've got questions, please feel free to put them into the chat bar and we'll answer those uh, either at a relevant section during the presentation or at the end. But uh, please keep those uh, those questions coming in and uh, we will have a time at the end for sort of just more general questions as well. Um, so um, just looking at the time, is there anything else to add to that, Fiona, at the moment? No, there's nothing else to add at right. the moment. Um, yep, we're getting ready to go. Thank you. Okay, and just to say on that, uh, that um, we um, we will be able to issue the um, the slides for the presentation uh, after the event. So uh, that's uh, that will be uh, hopefully helpful to people on that side. Okay, well, without further further ado, welcome again to the uh, the webinar. And uh, initially, I'll hand over to Henry. Great, thank you, Steve. Can you just confirm you can see my screen? <clears throat> yes, the screen is up, that's fine. Great. So I'm just going to be talking about um, three and a bit projects, uh, really, that we've been working on over the last couple of years, um, really looking at um, ventilation in schools uh, as a way to manage uh, air quality. Um, and, and broadly speaking, these um, these three uh, projects seek to sort of address uh, three really big questions. Um, how bad was air quality and, and ventilation in classrooms during the pandemic? Uh, what can researchers do to help change air quality in the here and now? Uh, and, and what can we do in the longer term? Because, you know, I'm an academic researcher. I have, um, I have no direct uh, influence with schools. We only can change schools through education and working with schools and also working with government to, to send messaging uh, via policy and, and the like. So the first project I'm going to talk about is called uh, CIVOS, Changing, Changes in Ventilation of Schools. Um, and it's really about uh, using CO2 uh, monitors to change, um, to help uh, classroom staff manage their their ventilation uh, and the second phase of, of CIVOS which is still ongoing um, is really looking at um, whether um, there are things that can be done uh, at scale to um, support the the DFE's uh, actions around uh, the provision of, of uh, CO2 monitors to schools and then there's a project um, which I've marked with the plus sign because it has no name. It's an unfunded project and it's just some research um, that we're doing sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum. So in phase two, we're sort of saying what what if we do a very light touch uh, interaction that could be delivered at scale? What are the effects? And at the other end of the spectrum, if we go and sit in the classrooms and really hold the hand of teachers and understand what their needs are, um, what what changes uh, can we uh, inspire? Uh, and then a lot of people around the pandemic have talked a lot about air cleaning technologies. And there's a project um, that I'll talk very briefly about that's still ongoing um, in evidencing uh, the impact of 
of, of, of two of the most prominent um, uh, air cleaning technologies uh, suitable for, for UK classrooms. And then I'm going to finish by talking about uh, what I think is a really exciting project looking longer term at how to, to engender real um, change in both our understanding of air quality in schools um, and uh, the, the, the engagement of pupils and staff in that understanding. <clears throat> so um, in, in, in the CIRVOS project, it's a nice collaboration between research institutes and government. It resulted in a lot of conversations about uh, CO2 monitors uh, in the lead up to, to the government's uh, decisions. Um, and it really um, asking the question, can uh, displaying CO2 levels in classrooms um, help with, with, with the ventilation provision in UK classrooms? And that's premised on the fact that around 90% of, of UK classrooms are naturally ventilated. They rely on staff and potentially pupils managing the ventilation through opening and closing windows and then if we're going to make these changes how do we sustain them over time so we looked at um 40 naturally ventilated classrooms um split evenly across uh, two primary and two secondary schools and then this first phase of the project which i'm going to talk about um for most of the time today uh, is all about unintrusive monitors so we And, and only uh, upload data uh, to, visible uh, to us to really understand um, what levels of ventilation we were, were being achieved in classrooms uh, during the pandemic so that we could get a sense of the scale of, of the issues. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very recent work and we've just submitted it uh, for peer review and there's a list of, of all the authors and a, and a, a cross section of um, uh, institutions involved in this um, and as I said this initial stage we're really looking at uh, in the installation of, of what we call blind monitors so that the occupants don't see the data and then that uh, data gets um, uh, uh, at the internet uh, and, and analyzed by us um, <clears throat> and when we do have for these four schools involved and we have uh, monitors in, in 40 classrooms we're only going to show data from 36 of those uh, and just for completeness I've, I've included the comments there as to why uh, the four have been excluded but the key point is it's for perfectly valid uh, reasons uh, and we're going to call them uh, PA and PB for the two uh, primary schools so that these are anonymized and then at the secondary SA and SB. <clears throat> and so we jump straight in and look at um, the classroom temperatures uh, in the four schools. And it'd be fascinating to look at the data from the recent days, uh, which, which we will do, obviously. Um, but it, you know, if we start back in, uh, we started, um, we deployed the monitors uh, over the sort of Christmas period in uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, in the hope that we would start monitoring in January. Obviously, as things transpired, UK schools were not open for full schooling until uh, near the start of March 2021. And that's, um, and that's why we, we start reporting our data there. And then we report throughout the calendar year. So we span two academic years. Uh, and obviously, we don't report August because um, schools that are closed during August um, and what we can see is that um, broadly speaking the temperature ranges so the average this is for example the average in the school in the primary school A uh, and then you can see if you look very closely little dots for each classroom within that school that we're monitoring and then the bands the these bars show you um, the location of the maximum and minimum uh, average classroom temperature. Um, in this case, this is the one classroom in December uh, was nearly 25 degrees, which is quite warm in December. Um, but broadly speaking, um, the classroom temperatures uh, remain similar throughout the year. And it raises the question, of course, so why are we, why are we starting to call them 
uh, by um, these names uh, which are associated with, with weather periods. And so we look to the outdoor data and uh, this is the temperature at the um, within a few kilometres of each school um, recorded by the Met Office. Uh, and what we can see is that one is, is March and April in 2021. Uh, and it had a very similar temperature to the average of, of cold two. Um, and then uh, we, the June and July, so the end of the academic year, uh, 2020, 2021, um, that's what we were gonna refer to as warm period one. And then in September, uh, the start of the next academic year, um, that again was relatively warm and we call that warm two. And we've shown some data from these, what we call transitional uh, weather months, uh, but we'll focus on, on the data in both the cold periods and the warm periods. And one thing you can start doing to see the sort of thermal challenges that are being faced by the schools is look at the difference between the indoor classroom temperature and the outdoor classroom temperature. And so, for example, in this cold period here, if you're ventilating by natural means, the air you're bringing in is on average, you know, 13 degrees colder than, you, the, than you, the temperature that you're maintaining your classroom at. That obviously has implications for uh, energy consumption, but it, all, uh, but it also means that there's a, um, a possibility that occupants will restrict the ventilation um, in order to, to avoid, avoid this, this cold air coming in. And if we look in these warmer months, this temperature difference is much less, around sort of five degrees. And there's some data here just to clearly define those, those weather periods and the outdoor temperatures. One of the key things I just want to draw your attention to is cold period one, that's March and April, they were on average outside of seven degrees. Cold period two, um, that was about 6.8 degrees. So notionally identical outdoor temperatures between cold period one and cold period two. And then we look at the CO2 data. Now, the CO2 data is, is really important. Uh, and what we can see is that there's uh, really interesting uh, trends apparent. We definitely get um, low CO2 in these warm periods. And if we look over in November, December, uh, we're definitely seeing increased CO2 levels. Uh, but in this cold period, one uh, slightly elevated um, CO2 two levels compared to say warm period one um, and, 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 and that's in line with sort of seasonal expectations. You expect uh, other data sets have evidenced uh, pre-pandemic that you get around um, double the ventilation on average in a naturally ventilated UK classroom during summer when you compare it uh, to winter. Uh, and here we're not quite getting that scale of, of things but um, we are seeing some seasonal variation in line with, with other data sets. And why is CO2 so important? Uh, it's because uh, human breath is the dominant source uh, and ventilation is the primary means of dilution. So if you know classrooms are great in the sense that you know that they're particularly at primary schools consistently occupied by around 30 or so individuals, uh, and then um, and then the excess CO2 um, tells you how much uh, per person uh, ventilation you're getting. And there's an approximate uh, inverse relationship between the excess CO2, that's the CO2 above ambient, so really the CO2 associated with human breath in the space, and it's inversely proportional to your per person ventilation supply. Um, and, and, you know, CO2 is also a good indicator of, of general air quality, um, not just uh, ventilation itself. Uh, and high CO2 is, is often li linked to uh, negative uh, consequences like uh, decreased cognition. Broad data set, that which we'll unpick in a deeper and in a bit second, but um, these are just, this is just a cold week in December um when um we and we randomly pick sort of four classrooms so these two classrooms are in the same school um and yet 
Um, we see relatively different uh, uh, ventilation levels or, or CO2 levels here directly. Uh, and, and then if we move to another school, uh, the bottom two there, the same school, and we see actually, so the, this um, 1500 uh, and, and, and the blue trace is the instantaneous CO2, the yellow bars, that's the um, daily average during occupied hours as um, defined by government guidance. And the government guidance would suggest you shouldn't exceed 1500 uh, uh, on a daily average. Um, and you can see that in this classroom, we are exceeding this on three out of the five days. And what's really interesting and troublesome in terms of solving these problems is that this is the classroom next door. Uh, and it's notionally the same. They have two uh, openable windows and uh, an exterior door each. And yet this classroom is failing the, to meet government guidance on three of the five days. And this classroom is meeting it on all five. And that's a real challenge. And one of the things we can do to look at that is to look at the relationship between uh, indoor temperature on the horizontal axis and scatter plot this against the CO2 current concentrations. And what we've done is we've marked all the data during unoccupied hours in grey and BB101, the government guidance defines the occupied period as, as nine through to four. And what you can see here is that um, in this classroom, there are obviously some heating, as you'd expect in December. Uh, the kids have come in uh, a bit before um, nine o'clock, as you'd expect, uh, and CO2 levels are, are already rising uh, and they peak and then they drop uh, down in the afternoon. So the question as to what's changed uh, there and, and, and it, the, crucially, it's remained in place really from about uh, lunchtime onwards. You've just seen this decay of CO2. Contrast this to this school, for example, where we can see um, up till lunchtime, we get this pattern of increasing CO2. Now, at lunchtime, it seems like they um, purge, ventilate the classroom, which is great. Uh, CO2 really drops down. They come back in, it rises back up and then decays down once they've left. Um, and this school is, is this classroom, the next door one. This is the one that was failing. It just seems like they're not ventilating at lunch change stable levels uh really very high levels um reached before lunchtime and then not addressed uh adequately until well after uh, the occupied school day so so coming back to this question of thermal challenges uh what we're going to look at now is is on the horizontal dif uh, axes, the temperature differences. So you can see uh, the warm period. You can think of this, if you like, as like the thermal challenge. So periods of low thermal challenge, warm periods. Um, and that, of course, you know, we'd go the other end of the spectrum having a thermal challenge if, in the last few days. But typically in the UK, you know, uh, that's why we've been so freaked out by the last few days. Um, this is a sort of low thermal challenge during the warm period much more challenging with cold drafts um, when we have our uh, high temperatures. And if we look on the average of, of all the data, what we see is that we correlate high excess CO2. So this is CO2 above ambient levels. That's sort of evidence of human breath. Um, higher CO2 values during the cold periods when the, when the weather is, is thermally more challenging and, and, and the CO2 levels decrease in our in our warmer periods. But if we just look, and it's worth saying that um, if we look back at this slide, it's already interesting that this school doesn't adhere to sort of any um, any of the trends that's evident in the other three schools. So already there's a suggestion that um, things can be more complicated depending on the particular school. If we look at the three schools that exhibit similar behaviour, uh, this trend of, of high, higher CO2s when it's thermally more challenging is there. Um, but what's really interesting is if we remove the data from cold two, so November, December, it wouldn't be true. So in cold one, when March and April, when schools had just reopened after the pandemic, um, a lot of focus on ventilation, a lot of focus on tra COVID transmission, and the schools managed to keep uh, really low CO2 levels. Um, 
and and then come uh, November, December, um, the same thing is, is no longer true. And that raises some very interesting questions because the thermal challenge in these two cases is, is really very similar. So if we want to untangle these, these trends, um, know that um, the, the potential for um, uh, driving ventilation naturally scales with the square root of the temperature difference. So sh the potential is biggest during uh, times when your temperature difference is biggest. Um, but so too are the challenges for thermal comfort. Um, and when we look at, at the data, this cold weather period, one March and April, that's when the challenges are greatest. Uh, and it's also um, a period where COVID-19 resulted in, in the attention to ventilation being at its greatest. So let's take our, our data as cold one as sort of being a baseline, what, what teachers can achieve when they really are focused on ventilation, even when it's cold weather. Uh, and what we can see here is that, so then we normalize all the different um, weather period data based on the data in cold one. So you see all the colds are at 100%. Uh, and we see that uh, during the warm period, uh, in at the at the end of that academic year, um, teachers were still very focused on on uh, ventilation, and the levels of ventilation even increased, uh, and then they drop right back, uh, and we see some quite um, uh, worrying increases in in CO two uh, during cold to the cold two period, so the end of the calendar year, November, December, um, which, which we can think of in terms of, of per person ventilation. Um, and we're seeing that we get about half the ventilation rate. Um, <clears throat> so this, this project's really yielded a very uh, interesting data set. Uh, and it highlights that um, even though at the beginning of the calendar year, March and April, the temperature challenges were the same as November, December 2021. Uh, the ventilation rates had decreased significantly. Uh, and we think that that's partly because of the sort of protocols for schools and, and the focus on those. The government's messaging had massively changed. We'd moved towards a sort of live with COVID message by the end of that calendar year. Uh, and then um, the school population attitude to the disease due to its own exposure to the disease may well have changed. Um, and there's various other findings that I don't have time to talk about today. Um, so I just want to um, mention that uh, the next stage of this research is, is to continue working with the same schools. Um, and now we're giving them in-person um, air quality, uh, in-room display air quality monitors uh, in, in half of the classrooms. Um, we deliver uh, behavioural training for the classroom staff to help them understand how to use these monitors, but do so in a manner that's re replicable at scale. Uh, and then we assess um, the impacts um, via the data. We have surveys of the attitude and the focus groups to identify the barriers. And it's been a real challenge to get engagement of the classroom staff. That's really um, been a problem with the project. Uh, and also at the same time, uh, the DfE have been deploying monitors to schools and that's um, presented other challenges. <clears throat> at the other end of this spectrum, this unnamed project, um, we're just working in one school, only in 10 classrooms. Um, we do have our air quality monitors, but here, the real difference is that we spent six weeks physically in person in the classroom, working with the teachers, understanding their challenges, talking to them about air quality. And that's a very different approach. Um, and we're able to um, uh, deliver personalized training to those classroom staff and then co-design their own classroom air quality plan. Um, and that's... Um, been interesting and, and I can tell you more about that at another time. Um, and then the last um, project that's ongoing is, is uh, the classroom air cleaning technologies. And there we've got um, 
monitoring in about 330 classrooms in, in 30 schools. And the schools are divided into con control, HEPA and UV. So HEPA is high performance um, physical filters and UV is, is uh, filtering, um, uh, germicidal fil filtering of, of the air by UVC waves. Uh, and we, then we analyze the environmental data and crucially, we gather um, attendance data from across the Bradford area to compare our 30 schools attendance with all others. Um, and the real question that we're trying to answer in the coming month or two is, has the installation of HEPA and UV uh, over this entire school year uh, had an effect on attendance that's linked to uh, infection prevalence within uh the HEPA and UV schools. And just to say the logistics of these sorts of projects are a complete nightmare. So the suggestion that we can just roll out HEPA without thinking about it is 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 uh, is nonsense. You know, schools don't have enough plug sockets. So there's a start. You've got to go and get electricians to install those. Noise can be a factor. Heat, certainly from the UV, can be a factor. Um, and then from our own research perspective, uh, the quality assurance on on data at this scale is, is really challenging. <clears throat> and I'm gonna um, slightly rush through through the next question of, of what can we do in the longer term and, and tell you about um, the SAMI project, Schools Air Quality Monitoring for Health and Education. And it starts um, very soon uh, uh, from its main uh, funder, uh, but the DFE uh, got quite excited about this and, and have, um, enabled us to, to start work uh, in advance. Uh, and we're looking to create a national scale resource for air, classroom air quality and do that in a way that really engages pupils and teachers um, so that they really start to learn and understand that about their air quality and want to engender positive change. And part of that, we, we give them a monitor and, and access to uh, a web app that we're developing. And it's all co-designed and uses citizen science methods to really engender this uh, engagement. And just quickly, if we think about you know, schools and their communities at the center of all of this, and I think hopefully everyone on this call would agree we want to result in positive change. Um, and this is where our SAMI project comes in, but we're gonna do that obviously, there's lots of ways you can engender positive change in schools. Uh, and our aspect is, is via indoor air quality, uh, data and, and knowledge. And we're delivering these, these monitors to schools uh, and we have capability for about 2000 schools and the teachers and, and pupils uh, will be empowered to monitor their own air quality and, and feed the data into our systems uh, via this, this web app. And that will really inform um, research findings and, and, and policy, uh, but it will also be fed directly into school communities. Um, and so this is a massive part of our co-design, creating this app. Um, it's gonna be very interactive and visual to, to keep um, uh, pupils and teachers engaged. Uh, and crucially from the teaching aspect, it's gonna support teaching and, and the delivery of, of, of learning outcomes uh, and and also allow schools to um, assess you know selected interventions to see if they want to roll them out across uh, more spaces in their school obviously working with schools is, is ethically very challenging um, recruiting 2000 schools is a challenge and it's partly a, a call to arms if, if people are excited by this project get in touch with your local schools help them get in touch with us uh, and then we need to, to keep them engaged once they're on board and do so by um, presenting things in a, in a way that is fun and, and gamifies um, the scientific process. Um, and, and so you've seen all this uh, before, but just to add, you know, we're going to send a very low amount, one or two monitors to each school. And that really leverages the funding that we have to to enable us to reach 2000 schools and generate this national uh, scale data set which is really valuable uh, and then we have um various other activities um and i'm going to make sure you you have all these slides 
but it is a it is a bold challenge uh, but it is an exciting one i hope you agree uh, and we've got a lot of um different institutions involved and we're well resourced in terms of people so just uh, some numbers of, of to give you a scale that, that this project is something that's been taken very seriously we've got about 25 people working on the, on the project itself guided by about 13 people and then this engagement of panel of of um uh of people working in schools and that might be uh you if you're if you're interested please get in touch um and uh it we really do have a great set of specialities and expertise and good links to 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 various um uh, routes to to, the, to deliver change at, at all scales across the UK, and that's really uh, very exciting. So I'm not going to read these intended outcomes. I think I've sort of uh, spoken through them as I went. Uh, so I will stop sharing my screen now, if I can work out how, um, and pass you over to Herschel. Thanks, Henry. I will just share my screen and then I think we'll take some questions towards the end. Um, Top middle. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. <laughs> right, has that come up? Yeah, that's up. Just need to do your slide. Brilliant. Share. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Henry, for that. It was a nice little introduction. So I think um, this presentation is sort of the other extreme rather than the academic side, looking at the reality of ventilation in schools and what the DfE have done to sort of promote ventilation, particularly during the COVID period. Um, so those of you who don't know me, I'm Herschel Patel. I'm the head of energy, environment and embodied carbon at the Department for Education. So effectively responsible for some of the sustainability uh, policies for the built environment uh, for schools and further education colleges within within England. Um, so this first slide is just to give a bit of context. Um, I won't go through all the numbers, but it just shows the sorts of sectors, education sectors that we are uh, involved in and the number of those. So there's a huge number of buildings that we are, you know, we're not directly responsible for them, but we're obviously responsible from central government perspective, ensuring that the right policies and guidance and to some extent regulations are in place to uh, support schools in making sure they can remain open. Um, this next slide, I've, I've presented it a number of times, but I think it's quite powerful just to show the, uh, the diversity within the estate. Um, so huge amounts of, uh, sorry, 20, so about 70,000 buildings spread over, you know, best part of 100, 120 years of, of build uh, periods. Um, so the department's response to COVID-19. So in 20, 20, 2019, we obviously had the, the pandemic hit us. Um, our position around uh, COVID-19 was was to obviously try and keep schools open. That was that was the, the Secretary of State's priority at, um, during that period. Um, through the evidence, you know, particularly the Sage paper, we found that aerosol transmission was one of the one of the key transmission routes, which led to a huge amount of investment of resource into trying to address better ventilation into schools. Um, and also, we worked with the likes of SIBSI and uh, UK HSA. Um, formerly Department of Health and Social Care, to understand what we should be doing in those areas. But I think just that first bit here, the position, sorry, the position in 2020, it's important to note that ventilation has always been a priority for government. It's always been uh, a priority from, from HSE's perspective, but also from uh, the Department of Education's perspective. We haven't changed that position through the pandemic. I think what the pandemic's done is given us a platform to talk about ventilation more and I think everyone on this call recognizes why ventilation is an important aspect not just given the last couple of days and the pandemic but also from various health and well-being perspectives and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> what we also found from our evidence an initial bit of um, uh, sort of discussions with uh, some of the settings is there was a limited understanding of what ventilation was and, and the difference between CO2 um, and CO carbon, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide um, we really need to set out some clear and concise guidance to support schools, particularly those those teachers in classrooms operating the ventilation. Um, there are a number of competing priorities, particularly during the winter period in managing thermal comfort. 
And the last bit there is evacuating classrooms, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, so the actions that we took as the department is we we uh, sent out almost 400,000 uh, CO2 monitors, which covered 50% of teaching and learning spaces. And those were really used to, as sort of Henry touched on uh, partly in his presentation, was really used to do two things. One was the intention was to um, understand where spaces were poorly ventilated. Um, and the second part of this presentation talks about what we found through site visits of those poorly ventilated spaces. Um, and the second part of it was to help schools manage thermal comfort and ventilation. We're coming back to those competing priorities. And when we found that um, using that data and using some of the feedback that we got from schools, if they were still continuing to have ventilation problems, um, they were able to make an application for some air cleaning devices for the short term. Air cleaning devices are a short term solution in trying to address uh, good air quality in spaces, but they were given air quality devices to help control trans, uh, aerosol transmission routes. Um, and then as, at the back of that, we learned quite a few things. So 12% uh, of settings use monitors, sorry, reported using monitors reported sustained high levels of CO2, but only 3% said they couldn't bring that number down through either quick fixes, um, which includes simple things like opening windows. There was so clearly we learned that there was a bit of a uh, uh, consider a, a lack of understanding or knowledge around when to open windows and things. Um, and some of the other things that we learned from more operational perspective, and Henry touched on some of this, is um, user behavior around CO2 monitoring, um, balancing, again, thermal comfort and ventilation against noise. So we have a lot of schools in noisy noisy sites. Um, the infrastructure um, side of things, so connecting things like air cleaning devices up to power sources and avoid trying to avoid trailing cables. And then there was a the maintenance side of things as well, so particularly replacing filters and managing those those units. Um, so I've just thrown this slide in, in uh, very last minute, but this was a really important slide because what this headline says is that pupils evacuated uh, school in Sorry, pupils evacuated to school installs air quality alarms to stop the spread of, of COVID-19. And what the head teacher said here was that as soon as it goes red, they would evacuate a classroom. Um, and then when it goes back to green, they would they would bring the pupils back into the classrooms. That is exactly what we wanted to avoid by the use of CO2 monitors. And this was all that this was an article before we issued um, our guidance and CO2 monitor schools. But it's really important that kids were kids were able to remain in classrooms. So the guidance that we produced was about managing those expectations of those end users and how they should be uh, controlling their environments to make sure kids can stay in classrooms rather than have very sort of reactive, extreme reactions to high CO2 levels. So whatever it is, the, the idea was to create the awareness, the education and learning, whatever we decided to call it, but make sure we take those users on the journey with us. And we're continuing on this journey now we've started to come out of this pandemic. Um, so as we move forward, so what's really important for us, and particularly those uh, who are engineers or those that build schools on this on this call, is that we need to use the 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 the, the pandemic as a platform to to raise awareness around how to create healthy indoor environments in education settings. Um, I won't go through all of this in detail, but I think they're, they're fairly obvious. The balancing priorities, particularly around things like climate change, rising energy costs, acoustics, I've already touched on. Um, is an incredible challenge when balancing that against uh, sort of competing factors against ventilation. Um, Henry's covered some of these research projects that we're working on. Um, we as the DFE have done some site visits just to look at those schools that say they have poor ventilation. What are the causes of those poor ventilations? Um, and also moving forward, that post-pandemic learning, we, you know, we know we need to create better behavioural change, particularly we talk about sustainability, we talk about simple things like turning lights off, but what about creating good, healthy environments, um, increasing that awareness, et cetera. So just as, as I said, I'll, I'll touch on the site visit. So I've just got some images of some of the um, pictures we took during our site visits um, of what's what's been the causes of poor ventilation. So this is the first one. I think it's fairly fairly obvious what this is, but the you know the effective free area of this window is quite minimal, um, which limits the ventilation gains. And I, there's no point in dwelling on this too much, but as designers and construction professionals, you know, what can we do? What are the window solutions that we could be using to improve those? Now we've seen some 
um, condition improvement fund projects where windows have been replaced and they've been replaced with windows like this. This is an, an example of that. But it's to say that what can we do as designers and construction professionals to improve those window solutions to improve ventilation? Um, the next one, which we see time and time again, and I'm sure those that work for local authorities will visit existing schools have seen this, is we have windows painted shut. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we have windows painted shut, which effectively reduces that effective uh, free area of opening, albeit this one looks like it opens quite well. But I think, you know, the the way that the building was intended to be used is sometimes uh, through time and through, you know, either condition need or health and safety needs of that building, the intended purpose of say windows, for example, uh, um, are taken away because of because of those those issues. So, you know, big free areas being closed off. Um, the next one is a classic one, blinds in front of openable windows. I think it's fairly obvious why the blinds are down here, but, um, you know, it does restrict your 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 airflow and ventilation path into those into those classrooms. Um, so again, it comes down to what could we be doing with those windows. Now I know we can't just go around and change every single window in every single school, but there's a lot of consideration that we need to do to ensure those competing factors are considered, um, and we design solutions uh, holistically. Um, and this this was a really really good one. So this is another example of the intended purpose of the sorry the intended strategy of this um, ventilation solution. This school was was cross flow, um, and a new ceiling was put in, and it completely blocked off the cross flow strategy. Um, you know, particularly on hot days, that would have been a fantastic solution uh, to to ventilate classrooms, keep them cool, as well as get good good airflow in them during the winter periods to reduce CO two levels, but you know, the contractor or the supplier or the local authority, whoever fund, funded this or project managed this, clearly didn't give any consideration to the existing use of that of that space, um, which reduces its overall performance. Um, and then this is the last one, uh, sorry, the penultimate one, but this is a, a new build school. Um, and I've obviously hidden any any key things that might give away who, who what it is or where it is or who the contractor was. But this was a really good example. So this picture in the bottom right has the blinds down and the lights on. Well, that classroom was somewhere on this facade. And the reason why that happened was because the Mooga is adjacently right outside the building. Um, so the intent, you know, the designers intended that the blinds would be up. Um, there was no solar gains at this time or, or, or glare. The reason why they're down is because of the distraction from this Mooga. And again, it comes back to those design solutions that we put in place uh, and those designs um, and site layouts that we put in, how does that impact the actual intended use of those buildings? So the blinds are constantly down because there's constantly kids in this Mooga area, which is distracting the kids in the classroom. So it's almost no point in having a window if the blinds are going to be down constantly. Um, and then and then the last one, I just threw this one here. It's not probably not directly relevant, but there was a young, la uh, young lady in primary school who lived on the South Circular. Her school was on the South Circular and the air quality issues associated with that school ultimately led to her and, and home ultimately led to her passing away. And the coroner's report said it was because of, of air quality. And I think there's a big drive to sort of improve air quality on our school sites. Um, it's an incredible challenge because it's not wholly within the DFV's control to improve air quality. A lot of it sits with local authorities um, and transport. But trying to improve that is really, really important to us as a department. And the bottom right picture here is just giving an example of the, the location of that block. Now, I know there's a number of competing factors of where we build buildings and, and um, where they're constructed. But this block is no more than about 10 or 15 meters away from a very busy main road. Um, and it's naturally ventilated or mixed mode. Um, again, you know, what does that mean for those occupants within those classrooms? How can we be improving that as construction professionals moving moving forward? Sorry, I whizzed through that because I was conscious I wanted to get through some of the questions. So if that's OK, that's uh, that's my presentation pack done. OK, Henry and Herschel, thank you very much for the uh, presenting the data and the items on there. I see, uh, just thinking with questions, there was a number of questions that uh, were in the chat bar, and I think uh, Henry's been answering some of those, but a lot of them appear to be uh, questions on uh, the type of uh, buildings that were being monitored previously. And I think with that, uh, Henry's gone through those saying that you know, it's a mixture of new and old build. Uh, so, so we're getting a feel for that. So I think that's answered. 
a lot of them on that side and also about orientation and uh, about the control systems, whether they were fully automatic or manually controlled. Um, I suppose just another couple comments on those I can see about there was about the um, how the, um, um, the the CO2 monitoring systems, how they're actually uh, uh, how they can impact on the usage of the of, of the pupils. Again, I know this was uh, a comment there about uh, in uh, uh, SEN buildings or type schools that they have to be quite careful of what how the displays are, the interact with displays and the impact they have had on them. Found a very similar situation where we put a lot of uh, CO2 monitoring in primary schools. Um, uh, we explained the systems to them and then we got the, res the uh, response back or oh, can you please stop the beeping it's very distracting but saying well the beeping in the background the audible side of it would say look it's starting to you need to do something about the mo uh, about the uh, the co2 levels and changing those sort of things um so again it's very important the user understanding of the systems as you said another one we had that's a secondary school where we had uh, a lights to the front blue for blue for fine red for do something about your ventilation and uh, it went around the school that the the red light was meaning there was carbon monoxide in the building everybody had to evacuate so it's it's really quite they're really important to, to get that strategy understood. Um, I'm just looking through to any other questions that came up there. <laughs> um, I suppose one of them on there was looking just at... One, gone through. one comment, Steve, Henry. to say um, all of the monitors that we've ever used and the ones that the DFE have deployed never have audio alarms for mm. that very reason, that it should be... It shouldn't be something that dominates teaching and learning. The kids are there to teach, to be taught and, and to learn. It is there to facilitate a better in management of the space and, and alarms aren't helpful in that regard. Yeah, no, we did switch them off on them. It had, a, had an option to do that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as you say, there's other things on there. Um, just one of the, I suppose the other, one of the questions I saw before was on there about the, um, um, when you were really talking about, are you advising with still natural ventilation as a way to, natural ventilation is a way to go, or do we think as we're going forward that may change? I know all of the building majority of the building stock we've got is naturally ventilated, but do you think there's a drive on that side to go down a more mechanical ventilation, especially when we're considering uh, low energy schools, etc.? Uh, I think the simple answer is yes, our output specification sort of pushes towards a mix, certainly a mixed mode solution, which then does pick up some, some of the mechanical aspects. And I think that is to balance against um, uh, forced, forced ventilation and controlled ventilation, I'd say rather, um, and mm -hmm. addressing things like overheating risk as well as good ventilation during, during winter. So I think, I think the answer is we're more than likely mm -hmm. yeah, going to continue to push down that road. Yeah, just looking through the other questions. Yeah, there's other bits. Yeah. So, so um, just thinking with those. Then, so, so today was a presentation of the the findings so far. So, Hirsch and I is just looking through the group and the spaces is that uh, is starting to uh, develop the, um, the, the 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 data. And it's it's is there anything from the spaces point of view that you're looking for more input into that? Uh, it's been uh, we said there's the other schemes here that people don't want to be involved with. And where do we go from here? Uh, and uh, where should people be looking out for further information? Sure. So I think um, so. I think the first thing is Henry's obviously um, presented the the Sami project. Um, so if, mm -hmm. if local authorities or schools are interested in that Sami project, then, then do get in touch with Fiona um, Henry via Fiona to sort of put yourself forward. Because so I think it's a really exciting opportunity to get involved in how we. Connect. I think we're. We've saturated that market now. This is really for those end users. So how can how can we produce something to educate teachers and possibly pupils and and uh, less technical people around the benefits of good ventilation? Um, I think from the perspective of spaces, I think it's always good to collaborate. Uh, love to hear what what's going on, whether it's your role as as professionals or governors or as parents. What's happening within the industry or your or the schools that you're seeing um, around ventilation and other areas. Um, yeah, we're welcome to to hear about that and collaborate. Okay, yeah, Henry, we're, excellent. We're fine with that. Um, obviously, we do share stuff, as everyone is aware. Uh, so, if you want to forward anything to me? I'll stick it out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm just looking through if there are any others. I, th I think most, say, there's, there's comments in the side there. Um, I think we've covered most of those. And um, again, again, it is looking at uh, most of the questions were from the um, surveys that were taken, all the, the, the results of what type of buildings were they. Um, then there's a further other ones going through about um, how we're looking at uh, do we go naturally ventilated or do we go mechanically ventilation with heat recovery yeah. and to how they're going through on that side. Um, I mean, so I mean, one thing I just add, so, sorry, Steve. One thing I just add to that is the DFE yeah. within their output specification mandated cross flow ventilation. So that's now mm -hmm. a requirement. I know that's obviously more much more challenging in existing buildings, but within our new builds, we have mandated cross flow ventilation. Sort of leads me on to visit Fiona mm -hmm. McMillan's point around um, above ground above ground floor windows are restricted to only 100 mil or less. How do we balance safety with ventilation, overheating, fresh COVID? And I think that's a really good question. So the building regulations that's partly driven by building regulations, but anything I think I don't quote me on this figure, but anything above something like 1400 mil, you can open them a bit more than 100 mil. Um, so it comes down to good passive ventilation, so low level, high level openings, cross flow ventilation, and, and understanding that I think you can open your your high level windows more than 100 mil. We're not restricted purely to 100 mil. If you can have a balcony, mm -hmm. uh, I think 1400 or 1200 or whatever it is, you know, I'm sure you can have a window opening more than that as well. But that does mm -hmm. that is subject to a risk assessment as well, depending on the type of school it is. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, just looking at another question here from Dave Parr. Do we believe that mixed mode and uh, through ventilation will be adequate to maintain required temperatures given recent temperatures experienced this week? Now, just thinking on that, I know the DFE specification for new builds, again, they're looking at different um, sort of uh, looking at uh, different scenarios. climate conditions. So, mm -hmm. uh, scenarios. So, probably, again, like with all of these, I think that the, the current specification for new builds are probably very current and fit for purpose but a lot of these it's looking at the existing buildings that uh, i think is where our biggest um impact is because is it right is about one percent a year of buildings replaced so is 100 years to replace them all i don't know if that's a figure i've heard but it's just thinking with that i think the biggest issue is with the existing building stock uh and uh it's looking how um how we can adapt buildings and get users to use them in a slightly different way uh and understand the systems to get the best from them but it's whether there's, is there anything looking, you know, uh, Hersh on that, looking at how that type of um, discussion is going to be fed back to the schools and users of how they can use their buildings in a better way? Yeah, I, I think so. I think this is all about education, isn't it? Because it's funny because I've been mm. talking to people about, particularly the last couple of days, about how I've slept. And I've slept incredibly well, I'll be honest, over the last couple of days. And I live in London. Um, but that's because I'm aware of how to control ventilation in my, in my buildings. And I think a lot of this is going to be about yep. how we can support schools in, you know, mm -hmm. with the CO2 monitors, with temperature sensors or whatever, to be able to manage manage their assets. Um, I think uh, I, th I think the new builds are much, much easier to deal with um, at the moment, particularly mm -hmm. as we've mandated cross flow um, and, and put, as you said, Steve, put in um, higher sort of... Uh, specification around future climate scenarios but the existing estate i think is majority of it because we can't just throw lots of money at this that's just not the position government is in at the moment so i think for me a lot of it mm -hmm. is around that behavior and education piece and that's what we want to be doing is supporting them in and understanding how to how to manage their estate better not just ventilation but their overall estate mm -hmm. okay right thank you very much uh i'm just mindful of time um just looking when we come at the end of the session um again patel i'd like uh, sorry herschel patel i'd like you i'd like to thank you for your uh for your uh, presentation today and uh, henry's already gone so we can't thank him on those uh but just for other um other um sort of uh just during my we've got other presentations coming through and uh from the spaces group so please keep an eye out for those and hopefully we'll have a wide variety of topics to go through and again, if there are any further questions, uh, perhaps um, so Herschel and uh, Henry may be able to, to look through those in a little bit more detail if there's anything comes through on those. Um, just going through that, um, there's a poll that's just come through. So if people can answer that, that would be very much appreciated. Um, and again, thank you for your time. I'm just checking with um, Fiona at the moment. Is there anything else that uh, we need to go through at this time?
No, that's it. Um, Herschel, I'll make sure you've got the list of questions that have come through. Great. And mm -hmm. perhaps you can answer them <laughs> in a little bit more detail um, when you get yep. them properly. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I would say with that, that um, for the people from Spaces, keep an eye on these. You know, today was really highlighting the, the research projects that are going ahead. So if you are interested in those, it's, it's uh, some uh, feeding into those uh, projects, etc. I think it's really important to try and uh, improve the way that uh, the existing building stock's being used. So uh, keep an eye on out and, and of any of those, uh, those schemes that are in place. 